the cell prepares for meiosis just as it does for mitosis. But as the DNA condenses, each chromosome finds its homologous counterpart. These matching pairs of chromosomes hold equivalent genetic information, one set from mother and one from father. Next comes the first shuffle of nature's genetic deck. The two homologs trade genes in a process called crossing over. This forms new hybrid chromosomes. The spindles then place maternal and paternal chromosomes randomly on each side of midline. It is another shuffle that can lead to a host of different genetic outcomes. Finally, spindle fibers pull the homologs apart. This leaves the sister chromatids intact. With twice the amount of genetic information the cells will need, nature must cut the genetic deck in two. The second division produces four unique sets of chromosomes. Because they carry half the genetic information, we call these haploid cells. Many of them will mature into sperm and eggs, the reproductive cells called gametes. Bacteria have been helpful to genetic engineers, not only in providing them with restriction enzymes, but also with what are called plasmids. In addition to their single chromosome, many bacteria also contain tiny rings of DNA called plasmids. Plasmids are usually about 1,000 to 100,000 nucleotides long and act as independent, self-replicating molecular operators within bacteria. Plasmids are one of the ways that DNA recombination goes on within nature. While a bacteria's chromosome contains all the necessary genes to code for the bacteria's existence, plasmids provide an effective way by which traits not contained in the chromosome can be passed from bacteria to bacteria. For example, some plasmids contain genes that code for enzymes that digest certain antibiotics, such as penicillin or ampicillin. This is obviously an advantage to the bacteria. When a bacteria containing these plasmids dies, it breaks open and liberates these plasmids to the outside environment. And they are often taken up by other bacteria that then acquire the traits coded for by the plasmids. Genetic engineers can place liberated plasmids in a solution with restriction enzymes and cut them apart. 
The engineers then place the gene segment they wish to insert into the solution with the plasmids and then add repair enzymes that join the pieces of DNA together at their sticky ends. These new plasmids with their newly inserted genes are then placed with bacteria into a different solution that enables the plasmids to readily penetrate through the cell wall and membrane of bacteria. The bacteria that are exposed to the plasmids are taken out and grown in a culture for a short time. If the plasmids into which the experimental gene, such as the gene for the production of insulin or growth hormone is inserted, also have genes that provide resistance to ampicillin and amoxicillin, a unique technique can be used. Genetic engineers know that not all the bacteria exposed to the plasmids will absorb them. By exposing the cultured bacteria to antibiotics such as ampicillin and amoxicillin, they kill off the bacteria that didn't absorb the new plasmids, while those bacteria that did absorb the new plasmids containing the genes for antibiotic resistance and for, say, insulin or growth hormone, continue to grow and thrive in the culture. Scientists continue to grow these bacteria until the insulin or growth hormone produced by them is sufficient to be extracted and purified for use by human patients. This video is prepared by my colleagues Dieter Egli and Kevin Egan. And you see here on the left is a, what's called a holding pipette, which gently sucks on the egg. The egg is surrounded by a membrane called the zona. And you'll watch this pipette on the right first drill a hole into the zona, then go in and suck the nucleus out. And then another nucleus, which has been taken from, say, a somatic cell, a cell of the body, is going to be put in. So if we could start the video, please. You see now that this drilling pipette is going to suck, drill a little hole into the membrane. You can maybe see a little bit of the hole right here at the next part. This pipette, you'll note, isn't really sharp like a syringe. There you can see a bit of the hole. And now the pipette's going to go in and remove the nucleus. And if you look carefully in the pipette, you'll see a line in the nucleus, which are all the chromosomes lined up. So that nucleus is going to be squirted out now because we don't need it anymore. And there we have an enucleated egg. Now the next step is to take a set of eggs like that, and I'll show you two, and then transfer into them a nucleus from another kind of cell, a fully differentiated somatic cell. So here the enucleated egg is set on the side that it's held by this holding pipette on the left. There's drilling the little hole in the membrane. Here we go in. Here comes the nucleus from the right. The pipette goes in, and these pipettes are operated with a piezoelectric device. So you can't see it here, but it's like a little jackhammer going very quickly, like a Woody the Woodpecker, getting in there to then squirt the nucleus in. Here we'll see it again, a little hole, and the zona is prepared, and now the nucleus is going to be squirted inside. So there's two, two examples of what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. is going to be used to make an embryonic stem cell. So the egg cell has the nucleus removed. The nucleus from a skin cell is then injected into that egg. That egg, you'll remember, can then initiate development by dividing, making a blastocyst. Here's this important reprogramming phenomena going on, the details of which are still unknown. The cells now begin to divide, continue to divide to make a blastocyst with an inner cell mass, and then it's from the inner cell mass in that blastocyst that an embryonic stem cell can be derived.